Elizabeth's religious settlement of 1559 sets up her Church of England, and this really represents her attempt to find a via media, which translates into a middle way. She wants a church that will unite the people behind her and that will keep the majority happy and prevent the strife and the anger and the uprisings and the executions and the persecution that has gone before. In this church, she's looking for a Protestant set of ideas and a Protestant interpretation of the Bible. We call that a doctrine. So it's got a Protestant doctrine. Protestant, there we go, doctrine. But she does want to keep some of the Catholic rituals because the majority of the country is Catholic and she wants them to feel comfortable in the churches. Also, she likes them. Elizabeth uses some of these rituals in her own chapel. So she wants to hang on to those. She also wants to keep the same structure if she can. There are new ideas among the Protestants about different ways to structure the church and perhaps having committees that are voted for by members of each church. But Elizabeth wants to stick to the old structure with things like archbishops and bishops as well. It actually takes her about four months of discussion with Parliament to get them to agree to this and to get them to pass the Acts of Supremacy and Uniformity because Parliament represents a wide range of views. There are Puritans in Parliament, extreme Protestants, and some of these escaped to European countries when Mary was in charge and lived in really Protestant countries and came back with lots of ideas about what they wanted to see. On the other hand, there are also quite a lot of Catholic nobles in the House of Lords and they really object to the changes. So she has to persuade those as well. Once it's established, though, the country does, generally speaking, accept it. In some parts of the country, particularly in the south and the east, where there's strong Protestant support, it gets accepted quite quickly. In London, apparently, they had really enthusiastic smashing sessions for the statues in the church. On the other hand, in the north and the west, where there's a lot of Catholic support, it gets adopted more slowly and these areas the catholic areas tend to be more remote and more isolated so it's more difficult to enforce there as well but it is enforced and most churches end up looking something like this of the ordinary clergy people like tr priests less than three percent refuse to go along with it and have to lose their jobs. So most of the priests accept it. There's a little bit more of a problem with the bishops. Only one of the old Catholic bishops is prepared to accept this settlement. And as a result, they all get sacked and Elizabeth appoints 27 new Protestant bishops. And these are I love this word, try saying it, the episcopacy. The episcopacy is responsible for organising the church and managing the priests and administering everything. So they're responsible for organisation in the church and administration. And administration. Long words, bear with me. There's also Elizabeth's Ecclesiastical High Commission, which she sets up to make sure that all the churches are following her rules. And this is made up of churchmen who are called commissioners. So there's about 125 commissioners and they perform something called visitations which are a little bit like inspections. They travel all over the country and visit all the churches to find out whether or not those churches are being run 
according to Elizabeth's rules. And some of them aren't. So between 1559 and 1564, over 400 members of the clergy are sacked or sort of forced to resign because they're not following the guidelines that have been laid down by Elizabeth's laws. And about half of these are because they're Catholic. And this is really a little bit harsher than Elizabeth wants. She doesn't want to really crack down on people who don't agree with her laws. She wants them to give them time to adjust and to come round to her ideas. So after this, there are only visits every three or four years. They're also responsible for making sure that people take the oath of supremacy as well. A couple of other things to mention. Um, one is something called the 39 Articles. There is a church convocation of important churchmen, like bishops. So we'll draw a little arrow from there. And they come up with really a list of things that the Church of England officially believes in 1563. So this is called the 39 Articles. And it's a list of Church of England beliefs. Elizabeth eventually agrees to these in 1571, so they do get approved by the Queen as well. And then they form the basis of Church of England beliefs. And there's also something called the Acts of Exchange. And this is really useful for Elizabeth. If you remember, she had really bad financial problems when she became queen because she inherited a lot of debt from the other Tudor monarchs. And this is one of her ways of solving it because the church is really quite rich, it owns a lot of land. And under the Acts of Exchange, Elizabeth is basically given the right to take land from the church, so Here's some land in the form of a field, highly recognisable, and also church buildings. So she can take those if she needs to. She can also force the church to rent her land as well so that she can make money off it. And then finally, if she wants to give some land to, say, a noble or a courtier in a form of patro patronage, she can actually force the bishops to give that person some of their land instead so that she doesn't lose any of hers. So that's quite useful for her as well. So she can actually make the church give people land when she wants to reward them. So the acts of exchange are quite useful for Elizabeth. So if we look at what the Church of England can do, really, first of all, it can control what's preached. People have to go to church once a week, remember, otherwise they get recusancy fines. So the church really gets to control what people learn to really quite a big extent and they can control the messages that people are hearing and they can control the ideas that they come into contact with so that makes it really powerful. Another thing that it does is it sort of plays a role in communities. It guides people and it supports people And it plays a central role in communities and villages and parishes. And it really, it's there for every part of people's lives. It baptises them when they're born. And it marries them when they get married. That's a wedding ring. And then when they die, it buries them. 
so it continues to have a central role in people's lives, it also runs something called the church courts. This is a practice that was carried on from when the church was Roman Catholic. And this is where the church can control people's behaviour because it deals with what's known as moral crimes. These are generally issues that are a little bit too minor to count as actual crimes. If they were actual crimes, they would go to the criminal courts. But instead, the church is able to make judgment on things like um, things like drunkenness, things like sexual offences. So if people are having sex outside marriage or committing adultery or maybe bigamy, where they're married to more than one person, then the church could punish them for that. It also, weirdly, has a role to play in wills and inheritance. Apparently this really annoys lawyers. But the church, is all, church courts are also needed to prove that wills and inheritance are valid as well. Finally, the church enforces the religious settlement. And it also really legitimises the queen. Because with a working church that people accept behind her, nobody can say that she shouldn't be queen. And nobody can claim that she doesn't have the support to be, clean, to be queen. So having this strong, effective Church of England really acts as quite a good power base for Elizabeth. Elizabeth.